Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Blaschenberg. I am your host of Yoga Birth Babies, and I am so excited to bring back one of my favorite conversations. I had a wonderful talk with Gail Tully of Spinning Babies, and the reason that I'm bringing this wonderful conversation back is because I have committed to taking a very deep dive into the Spinning Babies methodology. By the time you hear this podcast, I would have returned from my trip up to Boston to participate in the Spinning Babies Parent educator trainer. I am so excited to become a certified Spinning Babies teacher. And with that, I have all this wealth of knowledge that I'll be sharing with the students in class and of course in the teacher training. And those that have taken class, you'll probably already recognize a lot of this methodology, which I've already been including for years. It's something I deeply believe in, and I'm excited to get even more foundation and knowledge to share that with you. If you don't know Spinning Babies, It's really about the delicate dance between the baby's position and the balance and room that we need to find in the pregnant person's pelvis and soft tissue. So if you've heard of those births, like my first one, that takes forever, a lot of that probably has to do with the way the baby is situated in the pelvis. And that can do because there, that could be because there could be tension or torque or tightness in the ligaments or the tendons or the soft tissue or the bony pelvis itself. And what we're looking to do is try to release that tension so that there's a lot of balance so that baby can descend and rotate with out interruption. So I'm pretty passionate about that, especially since my first birth, I believe was so interrupted because of that tension. So it's something I really stand behind. And as I've said, I've already been including in class. So when you show up for class and you start to hear these little things, you'll know it's from spinning babies. Now, before we get to this wonderful conversation with Gail, Gail Tully, as I mentioned, the creator of Spinning Babies, she's also an author of several books, Um, just a few things that's going on. I've had people ask me about how we're planning out and continuing our online classes, so I just wanted to clarify that we have absolutely no intention of changing what we have. We have classes seven days a week online, live stream, and then also re-releases so that you can take it on your own time, your own schedule. So check out our website at prenatalyogacenter.com and see that we can continue to work with each other no matter where you are. Maybe you're on the Upper West Side coming into the studio for our studio classes, or maybe you're totally across the world. We can still enjoy each other's company and community. Also a reminder that if you cannot make it into class, because I know life happens and you can't always commit to a full class, that I've got a free downloadable you can get from our website called Five Simple Solutions to the Most Common Pregnancy Pains. So maybe your back hurts one day or your hips or your shoulders. I've got something for you that you can do. Give yourself five minutes and hopefully after that, you'll feel ready to conquer the rest of your day. Also, thinking about what we're continuing online, not just our, our classes, but we have our teacher training online for January and February. And then we're going to do March and April in person. We're going to do September and October in person. And we're not back online for teacher training until November and December. So if you're thinking about this training, it's a very thorough, in-depth, evidence-based training. Check it out for January and February because it's going to be a while until we can work work together online. 
All right, just a few more things to touch base on. Um, a reminder that we've been partnering with Boober. So if you're looking for a lactation consultant or birth support doula or mental health therapist or postpartum doula, go to getboober.com. And if you use the code PYC, you get 10% off your first service. And then the last thing that I just want to take a moment for is just to say thank you. Thank you to our community. Thank you for continuing to show up and support us in person in the studio for our workshops and for our classes. And thank you for continuing to support us online. And thank you for the ratings and reviews that you have been leaving. It helps people find the podcast. And then that helps us serve even more people because that's really what it's about. We're at service to you. So, so thank you. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, please enjoy my really powerful and full of wonderful information with Gail Tully. Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hi, Gail. How are you? I'm doing really great, Deb. I'm so glad to be back with you. I know. I love your work, and I'm so excited to have a chance to chat with you. So I know about you. Um, we do a lot of spinning baby methodology at Prenatal Yoga Center, but for those that haven't taken class with me or you or know your stuff, can you tell me a little, or tell our community a little bit about yourself and your work? Yes, I'm a midwife from Minnesota. And as I started to help people, both actually both as a doula and a midwife, um, I had a question about how to help birth be easier when parents were coming to me wanting to have a natural birth, and especially a natural birth in a hospital setting, uh, and asking me for support. They may be prepared for birth in similar ways, walking and just trying to live healthy and having a great attitude. And one person would go on to have a straightforward birth, as was mostly typical. And another person may struggle for two or three days and possibly end their Then ask, you know, why? Why my body? Why me? What, you know, what was different? And I wasn't satisfied with the explanations that either the midwives or the doctors offered parents in those situations. The doctors would say, well, the baby's too big, the pelvis is too small. And the midwives would say, well, you're too much in your head. You're not letting go. And yet I would be with, with these parents from in the end of their pregnancy, the early onset of labor, throughout their labor. And I most of the time, Deb, wouldn't see a difference between how one person responded to their labor and another person. There was something else. And sometimes the labor pattern was different. The pain patterns were different. The, and clearly the length of labor or the work that they were doing was different. So I investigated why, just by observation, by talking to parents, um, professionals in birth, professionals in body work, Everywhere I could find information from traditions to modern research, I kept looking for answers, and they led me to fetal position. If the baby's angling into the pelvis with its chin up, presenting the full top of its head, that's harder to move through the pelvis, and it takes longer, and sometimes babies can't even get through the bones in that position. Whereas if their chin is tucked, they fit and slip through and rotate through the pelvis, and they come out spinning, and so we call it spinning babies. Um, and that's what I developed out of the answers to my questions. I didn't realize that's how spinning babies, that's how the name came <laughs> along. That makes so much sense. They rotate, they spin. I love that. So one of the things that I know spinning babies takes a lot in consideration, something that we do a lot at Prenatal Yoga Center, is talking about balancing the pelvis. Can you talk about the importance of a balanced bony pelvis as well as the importance of the soft tissue? 
Mm -hmm. Yes, people, when we say, or when we hear a doctor say, well, the pelvis is too small, they're talking about the bony pelvis, the hole through, the tunnel through the bony pelvis maybe being smaller than, than the baby needs, right? But when you think about it, the pelvis is mobile, and the pelvis doesn't have one shaped hole for through the bony pelvis, through the tunnel, through the center. It has three different areas that have three different shapes. And that's why the baby turns this way to fit one, turns another way to fit the next, and finally turns to face the back, usually, to fit out the bottom. And the soft tissue pelvis is all the support in the middle of those bones. So you think about a, a think about a curving bony pelvis. There's lots of openings in it, right? The sciatic notch, the foramen, the arch. There's lots of places where, that look empty, but no, indeed, they're they're surrounded and supported by muscles. We know the pelvic floor muscles makes a nice circle. It's not really a circle though, Deb, it's a buttonhole shape. It's you know, most babies might come into the pelvis facing the side if that pelvis has more room side to side. Some pelvises have more room front to back, so they'll, those babies will come in facing front or back. But the babies that come in facing side to side because the pelvis is roomy there. But everybody's pelvis in the middle has an opening in the pelvic floor that's front to back. So the baby wants to line up with its chin tucked on the pelvic floor that way. Now, we live in gravity, and twists and falls in gravity can pull our muscles into tension or pull them over to the side. Or if we do super core strength, we have a very tight, small buttonhole, and our baby is a nice big button going through it. So that will either hold the baby back or even hurt. Or if we've had a fall and we have a spasm there, we might not feel the pain of the spasm we could have it for decades. But when, when labor says, okay, now our pelvis has to move and this buttonhole has to stretch open, now we'll feel it. And so we can have a lot more comfort in labor and a lot more ease for the baby to move through the soft tissue pelvis by doing some stretch exercises for longer pelvic floor muscles, not stronger pelvic floor muscles, because a long pelvic floor will be strong. It will be supple. It'll be like the willow that sways with the wind instead of the oak that's strong but topples over mm. or breaks off, you know. And so we want long. They function better, so they help us to stop urination when we want to. Now, it's not just about the pelvic floor. We have ligaments to the cervix. So think about the cervix. You know, the cervix is often described as like a donut, with a hole in the middle at the bottom of the cervix, at the bottom of the uterus. So the uterus is often described like it's a sack with this cervix as the opening at the bottom, <clears throat> which that's a pretty easy way to think about it, or a water balloon. But the um, <clears throat> the cervix opens with contractions. But yet, let's think a little bit more about that donut of the cervix. It's more like a hub of the wheel of your bicycle. Deb, you shared with me, you just got off your bicycle. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you can think of the hub of the bicycle wheel is the cervix, and each of the spokes lead out to the tire, right, out to the wheelbase. And the wheelbase could be the pelvis. And all those spokes help connect the cervix to the fascia lining of the bony pelvis. So now we have three items, the cervix in the middle, the linking spokes or ligament and the pelvic ring around the uterus. If those spokes get twisted, that pulls the cervix tight and it hurts to dilate. So we have our fun technique called forward leaning inversion. We just do it for three breaths. It doesn't take long or in labor, maybe one contraction, which puts all those spokes back into balance. Balance just means not too tight, not too loose and not too twisty. And if we take a bike accident or a car accident or just a fall in gravity where there's a jolt, our cervical ligaments, those spokes to our hub, can get a twist in them. And we want to do 
use gravity as our friend to help our body move in such ways that it naturally stretches those ligaments and puts them back into place. It's not painful. It's not manipulative. It's simply letting our body get into a position where the uterus gives the cervical ligaments a little bit of a stretch. And when we come up, the uterus goes back into place because now the spokes are no longer twisted. Mm. That's so helpful. Um, We talk a lot about that and try to talk about how those babies are kind of shoot right out like a water slider. Usually everything's really well balanced. And those babies that take a longer time, it's often, you know, fetal, the baby's position. And so then during labor, sometimes we need to start to utilize some of these tools. So can you talk a little bit about um, stalled labor? And then if someone is stalled in labor, What do you do? (laughs) Sure. You know, it's so fascinating because as a midwife, we've always thought of somebody could have a short labor. If it's under three hours, it's called precipitous labor. And we we think, oh, that's kind of emotionally shocking on the parents and the baby. Um, If it's too long, and what is too long is really the tolerance of the person giving birth, right, and the baby. Uh, but if it's, you know, what is too long? Well, we certainly expected a first birth to last 24 hours. You know, maybe half of that is mild and gentle and half of it's with a lot of work. Um, and what I found is that in body balancing, not too tight, not too loose, not too twisty, the baby doesn't have to overcome tight muscles and we don't have to wait for the labor hormones to finally soften something up to really work on that cervix. Uh, And it's not just the cervix, right? It could be the piriformis muscles, the pelvic floor muscles, or the baby could just be resting up on the pubic bone. Mm. By that time, two days later, all the muscles are soft as butter and the baby's sitting on a shelf and nobody knows it. So we really talk about balancing the soft tissues first with a series of progressive activities that Spinning Babies lays out as the three sisters of balance. So the fascia is our connective tissue, and it comes in folds and membranes and and sort of like blankets around the uterus and the organs. It comes as as sort of like pillowcases around our intestines and internal organs. It comes also as hammocks underneath the uterus. And, you know, it holds them. uh, And it comes as also as a ropes, like the ligaments. Those are all made out of fascia. So fascia is very important. And the cool thing about fascia is it's very adaptable. It can hold a freeze. Like if we fall and gets jolted, It'll hold that tension and that thickness for years. But if we talk to the fascia in the language the fascia knows, it'll relax, it'll feel heard, it'll loosen up, it'll become more mobile. And wow, the body really responds with comfort and with making more room for the baby. Mm. Spinning babies is all about what can we do for the body to come into balance, to make the room for the baby, because then gravity and the shape of the baby and the the fact that the baby's head is heavier or the shoulders are heavier, that puts the baby into a better position Mm -hmm. if the space is available. So we're all about helping the space become available. We we lose our space from living in, in chairs and cars and sidewalks with cement and shoes and everything that kind of holds us back from a full range of motion. Can you talk a little bit about the psoas? Because I find it fascinating. I think of the psoas as like, just like it cradles the uterus and and it supports it. Mm. But we know that through different um, habits or activities um, or sports, it it can get tight um, and it can Mm, be mm. imbalanced. So can you talk about the psoas's role in a, I call it a functional birth where, you know, things just kind of, Mm. or a flowing birth. Um, So why Mm. we need the psoas to be balanced and supple and supportive and juicy. (laughs) (laughs) Juicy psoas. Well, I'm so glad you're bringing up the psoas because I'm about to do a workshop with Liz Cook from New York, who is the psoas goddess of, 
of information about the psoas at coreawareness.com. And Liz, uh, you know, she's really healed her body by understanding the psoas, and she's taught us so much. And, yes, you you mentioned that the psoas comes down. Um, it comes down like a guide on either side of a fully pregnant uterus. And, and when it's long and supple, it works as a guide to help engage the baby. And when it's short and tight for maybe too much sitting, not proper walking, like, like actually I was curious to learn that there's a better way to walk that helps her so as to be more functioning and more long. Um, then, you know, if we just sit or we stomp around, especially we don't use the muscles in our feet because we're wearing shoes or we don't use the muscles in our thighs because we, we throw our leg forward and fall on it. So we want to roll off our feet as we walk and glide forward, sort of looking almost like you're, uh, not really, not to the extreme where you look like you're cross country skiing, <laughs> but you get a little bit of a sense of using this length of your leg, rolling off and pushing off your muscles of the ball, of your foot, mm-hmm. and, and then actually using your thigh muscles to move your leg forward again and getting this full body movement in your walking and it's funny but when you start walking that way your feet get a little sore and you 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 start to feel muscles you didn't have but um you know in time doing that regularly you quickly feel lighter and more fluid and more energetic better bowel movements better (laughs) better breathing even because the psoas begins on the inside of the spine up underneath the respiratory diaphragm and the fascia there is supporting the back of the respiratory diaphragm and the psoas in the wrappings, you know, around the peritoneum. So as we, as above, so below, if we want room in one area, we have to make room in the other area. Mm Mm-hmm. That makes total sense. Yeah, and also, I guess one thing we should mention for those that are listening and may not know anatomy, um, I mentioned this this muscle called the psoas. So we'll just explain it goes from the T12 or the thoracic 12 and runs behind and often gets, you know, often it's connected with the iliacus and it goes behind the uterus and connects down to the, the femur head. So if those that are not one that note anatomy. Maybe you can kind of visualize that. Um, so I realized we didn't visualize we, it like we didn't explain that. <laughs> like if a muscle was trying to be a waterfall, yes, you know, and it drapes from the front of the spine, and as you say, it goes under the uterus, under the full term uterus with the iliacus. It joins up this bowl of muscle inside the pelvis. But then the cool thing, the waterfall part, is where it flows forward over the front of the brim of the pelvis on either side of the pubic bone and then comes to the inside top of the thigh. Mm. And that connects our lower body and our top body. It's the only muscle that crosses the knee. And you know, I like that idea of the waterfall because it makes me think of like the baby falling down this little waterfall or or like guiding (laughs) itself down this little waterfall (laughs) and out. I don't know. That's where my brain went (laughs) to. And you know, I just love waterfalls. I want to go all around the world visiting waterfalls, but it, it also gives that sense of flow, right? Yeah. And when Liz Cook and I are going to do a spinning babies with psoas and Liz Cook this May in Minneapolis, and um, I'm going to learn a lot more because this, there's so much to learn about the psoas. It's more than a flex muscle, you know, the flexor muscles. People notice it when you bend your knees right in the groin, Mm -hmm. you're bending your psoas. And when you put your knees behind, like go the opposite direction, put your knees behind your hips, almost like you're doing, you're really like a runner stretch or something. Yeah. Then you're getting some length in your psoas. So we want to sit up on our chairs with our bellies lower, you know, like if you sit up on your sits bones, I used to tell my kids at the dinner table, fair and square on your chair. (laughs) You're up on the sits bones, but in pregnancy, your belly becomes a hammock for the baby. And we're looking for a seat that puts the knees a little lower than the hips. 
when the knees are higher than the hips, like when you sit back in a soft couch, then that shortens the psoas when we sit there so long. When we sit so our knees are slightly lower than our hips, um, then we have a little chance of length at the psoas. Now, it, there's a lot more to it, but that helps right away. That's why we recommend a firm birth ball. Mm. And, you know, prenatal yoga, Deb, let's give you a shout out. You have your prenatal yoga center in New yeah. York. And prenatal yoga is really where I see balanced birth givers today. If if somebody's having a baby who's in a great position, uh, these days it seems like with all the stressors of the modern world, there's a couple things that I see that are typically, you know, they might not be everybody, but typically they'll say they're doing prenatal yoga, they're seeing a chiropractor or osteopath. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're getting balance. Because that's so important, especially, you know, if the person teaching the prenatal yoga thinks about a balanced pelvic floor, balanced and stretched out piriformis, as well as psoas, and then the bony pelvis being balanced. If we create that balance and we just give the baby more space and more of a chance for that flow of functionally coming out. So that's, so we do that in prenatal yoga. What else can people start to do? You mentioned the forward leaning inversion. What else can pregnant people start to do prenatally to create this balance before? And then we can talk about what if they're in the middle of labor and it's not flowing and what we can do during labor? So let's sure. start with the, the prenatal. Sure. What can they do well, prenatally? Early in pregnancy, in the first trimester, I really recommend walking in the calf stretch. Mm. Can you talk about the calf yeah. stretch, why that's important? The calf stretch helps the fascia from underneath the foot, around the heel, up the calf, around the back of the knee, up the hamstrings or the back muscles of the leg, and then hooks right to those sits bones that I just asked people to sit on when they're in. Um, The sits bones are the bottom border to the sacral tuberous ligaments, this support system for the sacrum. And the sacred, the sacred sacrum is the most important thing to a vaginal birth. So we want that sacrum to have mobility without instability. So if it's too locked up, it's not mobile, the baby has a hard time getting down. But for those of us that aren't pregnant, if it's too locked up, we lose some of our intuition, our perception, it clouds our thinking, you know, and it leads to spinal problems, which then, because the nerves go past the vertebrae, can lead to other problems. So we want to have uh, a mobile sacrum. That doesn't mean it's flopping around. It just means that it's sort of like has movement similar to breath. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very subtle. But as a midwife, I knew that if, if someone was laboring, a lot of people labor leaning forward, right? So... Um, and they like a little touch on their back. And if I noticed if I was touching their back near their sacrum during a contraction, it would almost feel fluid, like there's an underground river as, mm. as the contraction moves. It's not, it's not easy to feel. You have to have a very light touch. Um, you know, it's like watching a newborn breathe, you know, it's subtle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then if I felt that, I knew, okay, we're having a baby. And if it felt not mobile at all, like I was holding warm wood, then I would, the next hours, I would work on mobilizing the, mobilizing the sacrum. And that, for some people, it's a sideline release, which comes from the work of Carol Phillips, just like forward leaning inversion comes from the work of Dr. Carol Phillips. And um, that can sometimes be enough. But for some people, we have to resolve TMJ in order to have an easy birth. TMJ is that tight muscle, tight jaw muscle. 
That's so interesting. Can I actually have us kind of shift? So more prenatally in a moment, but you mentioned the sideline release. Can you talk a little bit more about, you have a couple of different release exercises. So yes. I'm, I'm, I'm scattering around a bit. So we talked prenatally and I'm going to jump a little bit into actually yeah, labor. We're talking, we're talking first trimester yeah. and the sideline release can be done in the first trimester. But it can also be uh, done during labor, can't it? During if, labor. Yeah. And it is the queen of labor techniques it's an amazing it's you anybody who can get a sideline release if if you have legs and a pelvis (laughs) you want to give it a go because it's like the way to comfort in life but uh it's a little tricky to do It, it, it doesn't work if if the person that's helping you with it can't keep your hips in alignment while you're laying on your side with your leg over the there's it's step by step to learn it and and you need a mature person tall enough to hold you on let's say you're doing it on the side of your couch uh you're gonna lay on the side of your couch with a pillow under your head so your head doesn't fall down or doesn't get it's not a big pillow so your head isn't shoved up because you want your your vertebrae all in a line somebody holds on to your top hip as you're laying on your side So if you're laying on your left side, they're holding on to your right hip. And if you're laying on your right side, they're holding on your left hip. And you're facing the edge of the couch. Then as they hold your hip still, you lift your leg up and over, your top leg up and over the other leg, and gently let it rest uh, hanging off the couch. it It shouldn't hit the floor to the point where you're not hanging. You want that leg to hang because that stretches the muscle. So now you, if you're doing this, you're noticing that your hip is leaning forward now. So your helper's job is to get that hip lined up. And not only your hip, but you need to have your shoulders stacked. And if your torso then with stacked shoulders, stacked hips is like a rectangle that's not tipping, then the muscles are going to start to release in your pelvic floor and your piriformis and your abductors, abductors. It's fantastic. Some piriformis muscles in the back, deep in the bottom, are so tight that people get sciatic pain. Mm-hmm. This will help lift that. Um, you have to do both sides so the floor doesn't release on one side and stay tight on the other, which would send the baby off sideways. Right. We have babies that are trying to find room in the pelvis, and the pelvis is t- twisted a little bit like that. It's because we cross our legs or because we use our right leg to drive or we, we have a dominant side, it's maybe it's maybe the reason. Um, then babies go off to the side when they're coming through the pelvis and they get a bump on the side of their head, and it can take hours to push that baby out, that's called AIDS and criticism. My, my son had that and oh gosh, I knew it was happening, especially when my, I saw my, my midwife did a vaginal exam and she, I just saw her face and I'm like, it's AIDS and clitic, right? Cause the part of the cervix thickens more than the other as it's pushing through unevenly. Yeah. And she, and yeah. I could just tell, she's like, you yeah. know, and I knew it. I just knew. And again, some of it comes from our habits, like you said, crossing the legs. And I just knew I'm like one side, of my pelvic floor is tighter than the other. And so yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of these are within our body. So this, oh, of course. The yeah. baby is finding the space. And baby's fetal malposition is not a personality disorder. <laughs> no. Babies are finding the space that's there, and they're, they the uterus is pushing them through it. So let's make space for the baby. Yeah. And then there'll be less pain and less time for the baby, you know, to come through there. They're trying to work together. Yeah. Their mother's it's a team. Birth. Yeah. They're definitely working together. And, uh, you know, with a birthing body, we want to reduce what's too tight. And sometimes we wear a pregnancy belt to support what's too loose. Mm-hmm. And the sideline release and the forward leaning version help what's too twisty to become more balanced. So those are some things that can be, that can do prenatally. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Prenatal, prenatal. and labor. And labor. That's right. And, sidelines 100%. Both definitely. of them. Both of them. What Everything we do. The standing Ex- release and the abdominal release. When would you recommend? Yeah. Is that also prenatally and during uh, labor? Yes, it is. Excellent. Absolutely. Because, you know, when is it 
too late to release what's too tight. You know, it's, it's never too late. Yeah, until but... that baby's out. <laughs> Whatever you <laughs> have to do to get that baby out. Yeah. The thing is, is we don't want to wait and see. No. Like for the person who says, well, I'll just wait and see what happens. Well, probably that's a fine strategy. But if it isn't, then, you know, for somebody who's got a lot of torsion in their body. So that's why we started first trimester walking, calf stretch, you know, sitting properly, doing some gentle stretches. Uh, we avoid squatting and, and core strength, no weightlifting. You know, I, I know I'm going to get in trouble with some people for saying that, but that's what I believe. I'm going for long, supple muscles. When you say um, squatting, no squatting at all? When, tell me what you mean by well, squatting. Well, if somebody... If somebody, it's it's not like, oh, I can't squat down and pick up that toy. I don't mean that. But we don't live in a culture that squats to, you know, I don't squat in my kitchen while I scrape my carrots <laughs> or cut my vegetables. And I don't squat to go to the toilet. Uh, I wish I did. A, a squatty, squatty potty. potty. <laughs> squatty potty. Getting free advertisement. But that's, that doesn't develop your muscles or your joints, right? It, it helps relieve the mistakes that our civilization is causing by having the convenience of toilets. And I'm like, hey, let that 85-year-old have their toilet. But why does a toddler run behind the couch to squat and fill their diaper when you're trying to – why do they resist that? Cheerios and the M and M's because they don't want to sit on that toilet, even if it's a cute little potty chair, to go poo. They don't want to do that because when we sit, we're turning our our bowels away from our anus, and the baby, the toddler, and the adult have to poop in a kink, like a kinked garden hose. Mm-hmm. And so they go to squat because it unkinks their garden hose <laughs> and it's easier and it's natural. And so we finally, with enough sugar and threats, teach our society to sit on the toilet to poo. And, you know, meanwhile, our joints and our bodies don't develop um, and we don't have the range of motion for squatting. So now we're pre- and hey, we're interested in the body. We want to do things traditionally, or we want to have the advantage, or we want to have the eat. But we're trying to expect that squatting with no prep, it, you know, that our bodies are not going to have to overcome civilization. They're just going to suddenly be that way. But you wouldn't expect that of yourself if you were to say, now I'm suddenly going to be able to swim a mile with no preparation or you know i don't know because we actually practice squat i warm them up to squat like we do as you said the calves kind of the back chain of the body work up the ankles the calves we talk about keeping the feet balanced so they're not rolling it on their arches we talk about how turning the toes out actually makes the sit bones come closer so the outlet's smaller and then when they're parallel or even um if they could be turned in it makes the outlet wider. So we were, and then of course we don't want the tail tucked, you know, we want the tail released back. So we work on yeah. squatting. Um, and then if the heels need support, oh, so because I think it's great that you work on squatting. Yeah. Cause some people, well, you know, the hospitals have squatting bars. And so I tell them like, yes, if you've never yes. squatted and especially if you have, if you've worn high heels a lot, your body's gonna be like, what are you doing? Um, so yeah. and, we the, and they it. can't, they come up on their toes Yeah, and, that's and not their tailbone help. goes in Yeah, and they're, and and they still there's a little benefit to that squat, but not very much. Yeah. <laughs> but there is. It's still vertical. Uh, you get a better contraction. But um, how do we make the bones move out of the way? Well, you're preparing your description of how to squat with your tailbone swung out is preparing for longer pelvic floor and more, you know more length in the pelvic floor. Um, but. But you're right. We have to prepare. And another way of preparing is to lean up against the wall, mm. you put your back against the wall, and just start to slide down just to get the thighs a little bit um, stronger. Yeah. And the thing that I, what I really mean, Deb, is I don't want people to go into a series of 
I'm squatting to get strong starting in right. first trimester with a lot of downward pressure, very yang, you know, uh, in a month that's supposed to be nestling and, and keeping the baby safe. And let's do all the prep for squatting in first trimester. And, and then maybe uh, second trimester, we're learning you know, we're doing, it's not that you can never squat in first trimester and if people that do squat a lot, great. They're there. I'm not talking to them, but in our society, uh, I, I don't mean I do a lot of squats at the gym. I, mean, I think I see what you're saying. So it's not about the strength squat. I think of squatting should be like your legs are folding like a ladder. You know, it's really just the hinges at the hips and the knees and the ankles. So we're doing it in a soft way, not a, a muscle. I'm holding myself up because one probably mm-hmm. doesn't have the strength and it's exhausting. And then we're tightening. So I hear what you're saying about that. All right, we're going to take a yeah. quick break. When we get back, let's talk a little bit, uh, keep going on the prenatally and also about, we were talking about the different releases. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we can talk about the different release exercises. We'll be right back. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Okay, we are back. So let's go back to the different releases. So we talked about the sacrum. We talked about sideline release. Let's talk about the standing and abdominal release and how some of this can be done prenatally as well as in labor. Well, these are two different releases that you mentioned. And yes. the abdominal release is like the grandmother of the standing release. So these are related, but they don't do exactly the same thing. Great, they let's go into it. Things. There's an overlap. Laying down, on, you could lay down on the couch with a cushion under your shoulders, totally in the position that I don't typically recommend. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, it's going to be for 15, could be 15 minutes, could be 30 minutes as you're comfortable. But someone's hand is under the sacrum. So, so let's say it's your partner. They're very gently relaxed, put their hand with no rings under your sacrum sort of like cupping your sacrum, but their hand's going sideways compared to the pregnant person's spine. And the their top hand, and this is where that person has to be mindful, is very lightly on the lower abdomen. So in the lower part of the pregnant belly, the abdomen, such light touch that their shoulders get tired because they're lifting the weight of the arm up. So if they're resting their hand on the belly, even in a friendly way, there's way too much weight on that hand. You, their hand would be so light that if somebody, somebody else came along and pulled the shirt, uh, could pull on the pregnant person's shirt and it would slide underneath that person's hand. That's Mm -hmm. how light their hand needs to be. Now it's not energy work. It's talking to the fascia. It's a physical. The fascia is physical. This is a physical technique, but the touch is so light that people think it must be energy work because they're used to touching to talk to the muscles. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about touching to talk to the fascia and not fascia, Maya fascia with the rolls and the pressure. The fascia really likes to, uh, we're not talking about rolling it into submission. We're really talking about a light whisper of a touch that invites the fascia to unwind. And that's why it's called a release. With one hand below and one hand above, there's an electrical charge that happens, and you can, there's little toys that have little metal things that you touch both of them, and then the little chicken chirps or 
the doll talks or something like that in the toy. Well, that's because you've made it, your body's a battery, you know. And so you have one hand underneath the sacrum and one hand on top, and that person does deep belly breathing, just relaxes. You can talk about pleasant things, but not unpleasant things. <laughs> and very light, 15 minutes um, and and it would seem like the baby's very active. And sometimes people say, oh, I feel the baby both in the belly and the back. But think about it. You can't feel a little baby kicking through the sacrum. The baby's not down by the sacrum. Um, and the sacrum's a thick bone. Those little tiny taps and wiggles are actually the fascia releasing. That's really interesting. Mm. It really is. And and you just have more circulation and more mobility in the sacrum. Um, some people will feel such a release, they might cry. Mm. You know? A lot of emotion just, stored there. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't know why I'm crying, but it feels so good. So again, this As, is prenatally or can someone also be doing it? Okay. And during you can do it in er, You can do it in early labor, but, you know, nobody... Very no one's really people staying still like that. on their yeah <laughs> on their yeah back, and yeah. that's why that's why Dr. Carol Phillips developed the standing release from the from the basic abdominal release. The abdominal release is part of a bodywork um, tradition, I guess, out of maybe the Barnes methods. But um, standing release because some pregnant people can't lay down. And so we use the same hand holds, one crossways on the sacrum and one at the bottom of the belly. And you can get more detailed with this. But essentially, and it's so light, it's like holding a balloon, but somebody could just tap that balloon out from between your finger, between your two hands. If you were holding a balloon in two hands so lightly that somebody could come along and tug the balloon and it would come right out of your hands. That's how light this touch is. And your everybody's knees has to be a little bit soft. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do a whole unwinding. And sometimes people will will really move a lot. It's you know, and some people will stand still. But with the soft knees, the fascia can start to unwind. And you again you feel it like little ripples or little taps or little champagne bubbles under the skin. These and are this is so helpful to for confidence for people to know that of course they can prepare prenatally and they can try to prepare and balance their body, but then also recognize that if something's you know, if during labor they realize, you know, labor's getting a little dysfunctional because of baby position that there are things to do. But the concern I have as I hear this is as a doula, I learned a lot of this because I had taken some spinning babies workshops. But what is what can people do if they don't have a doula that knows these techniques? Because when I was there, I didn't see doctors or nurses really helping in this way because we don't <laughs> want to just throw our hands up and be like, oh, too bad. You started labor. Your you know, baby's malpositioned. We're just going to, too bad for you. So, <laughs> what exactly. Can, yeah. And the, the wonderful thing about labor is the uterine contractions from first to 10 aviation and into the pelvis. So some people can even have really strong contractions before they even start dilating. They're like, you got to be kidding me. This is what labor's like, and I'm only two centimeters? That's is out of belief, you know? Mm -hmm. But really, the it's not about the cervix. It's about helping the baby get into position. So if we were to say, ah, here's an invitation, this labor is is just not acting like the books promised, you know? <laughs> so let's do these techniques. And some of them you have to, you know, some of them are only for healthy people. Like you can't go upside down in forward leaning inversion if you have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So let's prevent high blood pressure in pregnancy by having a good healthy diet with high protein, especially starting at 20 weeks, so that um, the the placenta and the liver and the kidneys and everybody's getting their protein, a little salt to taste and fluids, etc. So back to labor, we then we're going to do the balance. When we get done with that, we 
we open the top of the pelvis so that the baby can come in. A lot of the recommended birth positions do not match what baby and uterus are trying to do. So we've created an entire Spinning Baby Certified Parent Educator program with parent educators dotted around the world that teach parents in a three-hour class, approximately three hours, um, just how did you do forward-leaning inversion and mm-hmm. sideline release and, and a abdominal montiata, a beautiful Mexican tradition, or a jiggle, an osteopathic tradition, um, so that we are inviting the fascia to release and make room for the baby. We show birth positions, how to open the top, how to open the bottom, so that we're not, you know, sometimes even the nurses and the doctors in their meaning to do the best thing are having you push when they close the pelvis. That's exactly what you were talking about. Oh my gosh, it drives me crazy. I tell them it's funny. I have a story I think you'll appreciate. So we do a lot of, um, we do some abdominal toning, like the transverse abdominals. We do pelvic floor balancing. And we oft, I'll often put them in a, a supported squat on blocks. And I'll, I'll say, turn your toes out and tell me if you feel at the base of your pelvis, is it is it more open or closed? And then turn your feet parallel or even internally. What's wider? And I'd say, a good quarter of them say they feel their pelvic their pelvic bones are wider apart when their toes are turned out, and the rest are like, no, I think they're not. And I said, correct. When we turn our toes out, we bring our sit bones together. So I go over that every class. And then I had a student <laughs> email me in that she was pushing, and she was on her back, and she just kept yelling at her husband, make sure my feet are parallel. Make sure my feet are parallel. And after <laughs> I was like, what was that about? Because I kept saying, when often when someone's pushing, the common place is someone's grabbing a leg, or they're being told to push. Mm their knees mm-hmm. to their armpits and that turns their toes out. So they're making the mm. doorway smaller. So yeah. Yeah. It, yep. it drives me crazy. So keep the doorway <laughs> big and wide. I know. Let's close the door and say we don't know why the baby won't fit out. I guess we need a section. <laughs> big wide door. Don't make the door smaller. You, big wide door. <laughs> but you know why I think that the doctors and midwives have done it that way, Deb, is because, you know, 50 70 years ago, when so many women giving birth were anesthetized or they were in twilight sleep, um, if the uterus couldn't spontaneously bring the baby out, it was probably because the baby was stuck really high on a bone. Some people start pushing and the baby's really high and they push and they push and they push and the baby stays high and then they go to C-section. So in the old days, they figured out that if they put the toes apart and the knees apart, more of those babies would come down the pelvis. So now they do that with everybody, even though the babies that have already passed that part of the pelvis need the toes together, heels apart, and even the knees together. Yeah. And they don't let people push with their knees together because they say you have to make room for the baby. And then they take out, do you know what, Deb? You can make the pelvic outlet too inches smaller, two inches smaller by pushing in the standard hospital position. I know. It drives me crazy. Uh, there's a Lamaze saying, I think it's, I think the saying is squeeze the knees, birth with ease. So when we actually draw the knees in <laughs> or internally rotate the legs, the sit bones go wider. So even if we can throw someone on their side, then that top leg could be knee down and we get even more space. I, that's, it's all about space. you you hit it nail on the head. It's about helping the baby find its space. Well, it's so great that the way we get this information, Deb, is to cross over out of the birth knowledge into the bodywork knowledge. And um, the thing about spinning babies is nobody else had said when to do what in a systematic way. So for providers, for midwives and doctors and nurses, we have, you know, provider workshops. But uh, for parents, we started these parent workshops. We have a parent class video And we have free information on the website. I'm really dedicated to getting that information out. I don't, I I don't, you can edit this if it's not the right timing, but I don't know when you're going to air this. But right now people are probably wondering, should I go to the hospital to have my baby? Mm. You know, because 
they're at greater risk going to where there's staff that go from room to room, you know, and where do we go if where do we go to find disease? Well, disease is, congregates in the hospital. So why do healthy people go to the hospital? Um, you know, there's some economic reasons. There's some educational reasons. It's easy to educate groups of providers if we get all the mothers together instead of sending them all out to their homes. But um, during pandemics, we got to rethink our public health approach and see if that's the right approach or not. Mm-hmm. And and if we understood physiological birth better, we wouldn't be so afraid of, you know, we can always drive into the hospital when we live in a place like New York City. We can get to the hospital quickly. But, um, and we're privileged to have the technology and the life-saving cesarean. But do we need to have it ready for healthy people You know, if the baby's not coming, you can go in and have it. But if we understand physiological birth, we're much safer, both at home, in the birth center, in the hospital setting, wherever we're giving birth. We're safer because we're not fighting our own body's processes. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying. So I had a student yesterday that actually, she was 22 three or 24 weeks. And she brought up, I want to open my pelvis to help my baby in a better position. I said, well, it's not, and I kind of went to a spiel about, it's not the bony pelvis. It's more than just that. But that brings Mm -hmm. me to the question of when should people start to think about baby position? When they start to think. So is that before pregnancy, early pregnancy, mid-pregnancy, late pregnancy, they found out they're eight centimeters when do they start to think, is there something that I can do? This is on me, you know, like we rely on our experts to tell us stuff, but we're the ones giving birth. So when does that thought process? And like I said, the sooner you begin, the more options you have, the, the less likely you are to find yourself between a rock and a hard place. Um, If you start late, you might be able to do one technique, and there have been people who've been at the door of the operating room that said, wait, let me do forward leaning version, or let me do sideline release, or the midwives have said, let's try sideline release, and they have a baby on the gurney, or they have a, you know, like that can happen, but there's other people that if they would start by 20 weeks, they would... You know, we we don't expect a 20-week baby to be head down. The baby could be oblique. That would be fine. The baby could be breached. That could be fine. At 30 weeks, we expect the baby to be head down. The oblique baby, the breech baby, the baby laying sideways is reflecting the space available. And we can start some gentle day-to-day activities in our own homes to help baby get the room. And if by 32 or 34 weeks, we don't have a baby that's head down or, or the back is on the left. Or I would I would encourage people to pay attention. Is the back towards the left because they tend to have an easier birth. And we're looking for a baby that's head down and, and the back is on the left. That means they're kicking to the right side. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean if they kick to the left but they lean to the left, that's, that's still not the back on the left. Uh, the back could be towards the front and that's just fine. But let's help make room, and it might be that the baby is over to the left in pregnancy, but as soon as those uterine contractions start, the uterine contraction finds that it's quite easy to rotate the baby into position because all the tensions of of the world have been removed. That means we have to have an assortment of breathing styles, of relaxation methods, but also of slow stretch gentle jiggles, and various positions to help the body work together, Mm -hmm. the body and baby work together, you know? And I like what you said about when they start to think, because that put me into a thought of when they are starting to think about their body and their desires to find a balanced body and movement during labor, that may also help them catapult into a conversation with their care provider of something to the extent of, you know, I want to give my baby all the space. I want to help them my baby spin and rotate down. How, you know, is this something that you do? You know, and again, it's... <laughs> Deb, Deb, yeah. you know the answer is that- 
are going to look at this person like they're absolutely crazy. No, well, no, no. Okay, some, yes. But some care providers are, you know, let's figure it out. Let's not have to negotiate during labor. So again, this is a bigger conversation of if they start to think super early about you know, their birth, you know, even that first trimester, then when they are looking for their care provider, they can say, you know, like, I'd like to move. Do you practice in a way that you're going to yeah. be open to me moving? So I guess this yeah, kind of leads that, to... That way of putting it is perfect. I just like <laughs> make room for my baby. I mean, we, this, we're revolutionaries, you know, the revolutionists. Right, so but the nurses, think that. <laughs> the nurses are, the nurses of the world and the midwives of the world those that are with the families hour after hour in labor. And they're the ones that are turning spinning babies into a revolution because they're finding that these techniques are something they can introduce at the bedside. And we are going from people out in the nursing station saying, well, here comes another cesarean, to these nurses are saying, well, let me go in. And they do sideline release or they do forward lean inversion or they do some other position with the family. And, you know, an hour later, two hours later, they're having a baby. And it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens so frequently, Deb. That it's a revolution. Spinning baby is a revolution. I know it's brilliant. I, I I'd like to see more care providers start to think about baby position. Because I remember as a doula, I was with a couple, and we had talked a lot about baby position. And then we asked because the woman was like maybe six centimeters dilated, so the, you know the care provider was feeling the baby's head. And I'm like, oh, what position's a baby? And she's like, oh, that doesn't matter. And I felt so deflated because <laughs> I'm like, it does. So it would be so amazing if we could meld this all together. Together, that we all are in the mindset of um, balance and space and, and functional flowing birth, then we'd have much you, easier births. You know, the reason the care provider says, well, head down, to, you know, the baby's position doesn't matter. The baby's head down, now the rest doesn't matter. The reason they say that is because it all seems random to them and they don't know what to do about it. So it doesn't matter because if the baby doesn't come out, they have a cesarean. That's their strategy. Now, the medical literature itself is full of research that, you know, it matters if the baby's posterior position because it's more uh, long labors, hard pushing, tears, and, you know, babies that have to stay in the nursery for an extra few hours or days if they're coming out with a difficult posterior labor. Now, there's a lot of posterior labors that are not difficult, and there's a lot of posterior babies that turn with the help of the uterus in labor. So spinning babies is about helping more babies find ease getting into position, and that could be before labor, but a lot of times it's an early labor. And once in a while, it's just when you see the hair, you see Mm -hmm. that baby spin around on the perineum, Mm -hmm. Because they had to get south of the of the bones before they had room to turn, you know. So we're making room early on, and we're educating, 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 so that on one hand we can wait and see what labor can do, but on the other hand we can make it the most optimal setup so that we know that the uterus and the baby don't have to work so hard through the muscles and the bones. Well, I find, you know, this... and it's nobody's fault. Right. Honey. It's, it's the world we live in. We all sat in circle in kindergarten and <laughs> learned oh. about sitting in chairs and tables. And we did that for 13 years. Oh, I still sit cross-legged at dinner tables, which is just weird to me. <laughs> me too. I'm, kneel, I'm, I'm kneeling right now. I'm I sit cross-legged. My kids laugh. They're like, you sit crisscross applesauce everywhere. I'm like, I know. I'm short and I also have very open hips, but, but that's that aside. But um, what fantastic. I like about all this is it then when somebody hears from their care provider, oh, it looks like your baby's really big, instead of being like, oh, no, how's my baby going to get out? Then maybe mm-hmm. instead of going into that spiral, maybe we can instill, hey, the pelvis is mobile. Let's keep everything balanced and let's make as much space for the baby to come out instead of getting fixated on how's this baby going to come out. So I'm just trying to angle it in a different way, if that makes any sense, kind of spin it in a different exactly. way. Exactly. Exactly. Because a well-flexed baby, you know, one with a chin on their chest in the 
it, we talk about position, but it's really about that chin being on the chest. Mm-hmm. It's, that's more important than the baby's position because a posterior baby with a chin on the chest can turn. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so we're, it's as if the baby is two pounds smaller or four pounds smaller if their chin is stuck compared to if their chin is up. Yeah. So there's a, we have a really cool technique uh, that came out of an engineer named Janie King's work. She wrote back pain no more, and it's called abdominal lift or belly lift. And we combine it, spinning babies, I combine it with a posterior pelvic tilt to make room at the top of the pelvis in the bones. And then the belly lift angles the baby. And I think that the uterus uses the pelvic bones itself to tuck the baby's chin mm. during t- you do it one. You do it just during the contraction. Rest in between for ten contractions. It's amazing, and um, and that really can make all the difference. Yeah, get that. Yeah. Get the smallest part of the baby trying to open up the open up the cervix. Whenever we teach this in our teacher trainer class, I always say like, if you're putting on a turtleneck sweater, you wouldn't stick your face into it. You would tuck your chin, and that's yeah. how your baby's coming yeah. out of the cervix. Absolutely, and you know we can't do that one on an epidural. Yeah. So let's see if we can get to active labor, trying some of these techniques before the epidural. Um, You know, why do so many people want an epidural? Because they're afraid of the pain. And these are techniques that reduce the pain. Some people will find that they don't need an epidural anymore. And others will find that their baby's in a good position when they get their epidural. So they have a lower chance of a C-section because the epidural is kind of bottomed out their pelvic floor. Now the baby flops over into asynclitism or something like that. And, you know, it's like we, we want the muscles to work optimally. The epidural can be a tool for a spasming pelvic floor, but so can the sideline release. So give it a try. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Oh, this has been so fun. I'm loving this conversation, but we're going to take a quick break and we come back. I'm going to ask you for one tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new and expectant parents. We'll be right back. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Okay, we are back. So this has been so much fun. I obviously can tell my passion for this about well-aligned bodies and babies, Um, but you know, we're starting to have to wrap up. Truthfully, I have to get my daughter. Um, <laughs> I'll be waiting at school saying, where's mama? Deb, um, <laughs> I just adore, I adore you, Deb. Thank You're so you. real. Um, you. you know, a, a tip for new parents is so beautiful that you're asking me this right now. Um, I would say to consider that the advice around health and well-being is not always the path to health and well-being. That our model of being stronger, tighter, um, is really valuing the male body, which is is great for male things. But we want the the nature of pregnancy in any body. The nature of pregnancy is suppleness, is expansiveness, is receptivity. You know, and th- that is not the same as having a abdominal muscles of like six packs, right? So what is expansive but responsive? What is, you know, it's the model of strength with vulnerability, and that's suppleness. Mm. So what we've been taught is not always the path to the greatest health and to start to listen to your body. Um, If we listen with fear, we don't really hear our body. We hear the messages of fear. So breathing techniques and stretching techniques help put us, connect us to our parasympathetic nervous system, our rebozo amontillada, and our shake the apples are two techniques to activate the parasympathetics 
to create a safe internal environment when the external world feels unsafe, like times of pandemics or violence. We can be in our homes creating a safe internal environment with the Montiata, with the Shake the Apples, with the abdominal release and standing release. These techniques help activate our parasympathetics. That's where babies grow, where we digest food, we overcome constipation, <laughs> we have softer, more kind, more compassionate thoughts, better love making. You know, the light life is better coming from our parasympathetics. Mm. Yes. It's more creative. Oh, that is And such... these techniques bring that. Yeah, that's so good. And yoga. <laughs> yoga. Yoga. You know, how do we feel when we're done doing our yoga? Hopefully especially very good. It, yeah. Especially <laughs> those slow stretches. You know, I I just love that. And using alignment so we have safety and Yes. It's all just so great. I so recommend it. Oh, thanks. So where can people find your very important and incredible work? Well, come on over to spinningbabies.com and pour yourself a cup of tea. Get some of those cool computer reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, expect to spend some time. There's a navigation. There's a, a navigation that's called pregnancy. And there's a handful of articles there. You want to start there. You can look at techniques, but you'll you'll go, okay, these are cool, but when do I do them? Well, head back over to pregnancy, and you'll find out when and where. In labor, there's a labor one that gets you set up, like what about induction, and how do I get the baby engaged? And there's an um, important one that says in labor now. <laughs> so if somebody's like, I didn't do this, or, or I did it all, and I still need help, then there's in labor now. That's and so great. Cause I'm sure there's many people Googling. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> what do I do? It's in labor now. And you know, in pregnancy, we have a new ebook called uh, helping your breech baby turn for those families whose babies are not head down. It's an inexpensive ebook that, you know, frankly, you can get the information for free off the website, but people want it simplified and organized and I made it into a six day program um with a little emergency thing like but the doctor's gonna try to turn the baby tomorrow so what do I do today? <laughs> so you can you can go there but um use the ebook but you know I I'm really dedicated to people having free access to information and I feel like it's my radical contribution to to humanity. Oh, that is great. And I have to tell you, I spent a lot of time, I have gone through it. I've seen um, Spinning Babies also kind of transition in on the website. It's really clear. Um, so it's it's really something I hope our community goes over and takes advantage of because you are very gracious with your free information. So I thank you and I know our community does. And I thank you for spending time with me. I love talking about this. It really, I think it makes a difference. If someone can have a more functional birth, they often can come out feeling their body feels better. You know, no one wants to spend yeah. days and days in labor. So I thank you for the work that yeah. you put out there. Well, I thank you too, Deb, and the work you're doing and that you're hosting the Spinning Babies Approved Trainer that do Yay. classes in your yoga studio. And I just, your name uh, is always in the birth world and you're always contributing. I so appreciate the work you do. Thank you so much. Well, I look forward to chatting with you another time. Take care. Thank you, Deb. Bye-bye. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening.